Hello everyone, this is uh, Major General Alvarez Senda, 63rd Readiness Division Commanding General. And you know, I've been thinking about the COVID-19 and I'm really concerned about our families. Uh, the, the big, big concern that I have. I know that all of our soldiers, civilians, and contractors are very concerned about their families and especially those that have children, younger children potentially. And I was thinking back on, on an experience I had uh, way back in my military career at the beginning of 9-11 and, and what my son was going over. So I've invited Chaplain Siebold here, who has a, a background in uh, marriage and family counseling, to see if we can have a discussion about that, see if we can help you, help you out in being able to address some of the issues that might be present. Today, because there was something that was on my mind. Uh -huh. And you and I had talked about it in the hallway. We were, we, were, we were talking about your experience in the Catholic school system. Right, and, and with my son. Kids. My son, yeah. Kids, yeah. And when 9-11 hit, my son would basically have a breakdown after he was dropped off in the morning. And he would have to be taken to the principal's office. And he was very emotional. And so after about the third, fourth, or fifth time this happened, the teacher that he had the previous year noticed that. Mm -hmm. And she approached the teacher and she says, I don't know what's going on with him. And, you know, he's just having a breakdown, blah, blah, blah. And, she's, and, and the teacher that had had him the year before said, mm -hmm. I know exactly what's going on. So she called me and she says, Mr. Rosenden, have you talked to your son about what it means to be in the Army and what's going on with 9-11? And how long had he been doing this before? Well, you figure that was in September. That was probably, 9-11 was September. This was probably well into October. I mean, this was a month or so after he started to see that things were going to change. Uh -huh. um, I'm sure that he started to see soldiers going places and doing all this stuff. and that's what, But I had not talked to him about it. We had tried to kind of shield him and protect him from that, right? Mm -hmm. So what, with what's going on now, what, what should we do, John? Well, it's, it's interesting. When we're having this conversation, it's interesting to me that um, he had been going to school that the teachers had been noticing this odd behavior where he would have a time when he would cry and they'd take him into the principal's office and mm -hmm. try to cheer him up and then send him back to class. And then finally the, the, the teacher called you up pretty far into this right? Um, and, and let you know that your son's doing this and that um, you weren't really aware of it. That's really interesting because um, what often happens is um, we get so busy, caught up in what's going on in our lives and what's going on in the world that sometimes we forget to look down at our children and try to really be aware of how they're experiencing what's going on in the world. We just assume that they just kind of get swept along with it and they just kind of you know go along with whatever the family's doing and that doesn't really affect them. But um, it does. And I think one of the, the, I don't know if it's a fear or if it's a um, uncertainty with us uh, on how to talk to children or how to get children to express how they're feeling, especially the really young children, um, that we kind of ignore it and we don't approach it. But little um, children go through times of grief just like adults, they just express it differently. They go through times of being really afraid. Um, if they're more expressive with their fear, their parents know, but some children don't. It depends on their personality. Some people might, just like adults, tend to keep things internally. Mm -hmm. Some children do the same thing. And so unless you, you have this conversation with your children, your children, some of them won't necessarily express how they're feeling unless you really sit down with them and give them that time and attention that they need. And I think what's also interesting is um, sometimes children, and I have, I have met adults as well, <laughs> that you have to wait. You have to sit with them and sometimes be quiet and you have to wait for them to speak to you. Um, I know earlier we were having a conversation about um, a situation where I was working with a child that was about three years old, and this child had just lost, um, she just lost her father in a motorcycle accident. And the mother was concerned that the, the child wasn't coping well, so she sent, sent the child in to talk with a therapist. And at the time I was doing therapy, because I, I have that mm -hmm. marriage and family degree in therapy, and so um, we sat down with this 
this what we call sand tray, and we began to play in the sand, right? Mm -hmm. And all, all we did was play. We sat there and we pulled out some soldiers, some things that she might, you know, associate with her dad. And she began to play in the sand, and, and I waited. Mm -hmm. And then she would bring up her dad. This is my dad. My dad was a soldier. And then we'd talk a little bit about her dad. And then we put a, she, she'd put a box, and the box resembled a coffin. And, and she'd be playing with it, and then she'd say, hey, my dad was in a box. And I would just simply say, was that scary? Was that a scary thing? And, and she'd be like, no, it wasn't scary, you know. But it got to the place where she finally asked the question she needed to ask. She really wanted to know whether her dad was going to come back or not. Mm -hmm. And I had to say to her, no, he can't come back, right? How did, how did the little <clears throat> child she react? Was, she was fine with it. She, she didn't cry. She didn't have an emotional breakdown like you'd think, you know. She, she understood. She appreciated the honesty, right. I imagine, right? Well, it probably took me about an hour to get to that mm -hmm. point, right? I had to spend time with her, and I had to play with her at her level. I had to get down on her level and, and play with her and talk to her in a language that she understood. Right? I, if, if, you know, I, I find it easy to talk to my sons now because they're right. in their 20s and adults and post-college. Right. Um, but how do... What, what would be some of the key things that you would suggest to parents that had children? And maybe if you group them by, I don't know how you would group them, you know, elementary school, middle mm -hmm. school, high school, yeah. how, how would you group yeah. them? Well, there, there are age brackets that they group children into, but my advice would be you know your children, mm -hmm. right? Obviously, if your child is um, really young, that you're going to have to communicate with that child probably in drawings or play playing with mm -hmm. the child. Like you, you described know, this one like with the I child. Just like I described right? with um, little army soldiers or um, sometimes kids have um, like doctor, nurse stuff. Right. With, you could always bring that stuff out sure. since it's it's very prominent on the TV now. Right. You could sit it out there and you could you could use that as a, uh, a tool to use with your children and, mm -hmm. and they might start asking about all this medical stuff that's on the TV and it will open up an avenue for you to begin to discuss what's going on. But you have to really um, want to sit down and focus on your kids. and. And the young ones, obviously, they're going to either draw pictures or they're going to use some kind of play, you know, mm -hmm. a little doll or maybe the doll will be lying down and, and they'll do what they see on TV sure. and you might ask them, you know, what does that mean to you? Right. Or what, what do you think is happening here? You know, I have a question because yeah. you probably know me a little bit by now and you know that I can be impatient. Yes. And I... <laughs> So you didn't have to honor. You didn't have to answer so honestly. But uh, how do what techniques would you advise for parents that are dealing with young children, where they have to demonstrate that patience to let that kind of question come out, like the one that you described with the child, where you know, and then you kind of help lead them into a way, but. You have to step back. So how 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 would you help us do that? Well, I'm, uh, when they're really young. You really need to wait because they will, um, it takes them a long time to process when they're little, right? Mm -hmm. So when they're playing, they're processing all of this, right? Mm -hmm. And they're thinking, and, and you'll see them play, you see them play, and then all of a sudden they'll just pop up and ask a question. I had a nephew who was, I don't remember how old he was, maybe four or five years old. But, mm -hmm. um, he was struggling with the concept of his parents dying, mm -hmm. right? So what his dad did with him, and it sounds a little strange, but it helped him. They went walking through a cemetery, one of those really decorative kind of cemeteries. Mm -hmm. And they're walking through the cemetery, and his son just came out and said, you know, um, are you going to be in one of these graves someday? And he's like, yep, probably. And he says, is mom going to be in one of these graves someday? And he said, yes, probably. And then he said, well, um, will I be here someday? He said, yes, more than likely. He's like, oh, okay. That was enough? And they walked through the rest of the cemetery, and that was enough. Oh. Sometimes all it takes 
is for you to be honest. We often want to shelter our children and hide things from them, mm -hmm. but that isn't often the best process because they know something's going on. Right. They know that they're not going to school. They know that they can't see their friends and play with their friends like they used to. Um, they know they can't go visit grandma and grandpa mm -hmm. when, when maybe they had a visit scheduled. Right. They know something's wrong. So by you not really sitting down and, and sharing with them, and, and you let them tell you how far they need to go. You don't, you don't, for some, some young children, you don't need to spill out the entire process. Right. You only go as far as they lead you, as right. far as they feel like they need to go. The older children, you know, you can go as much farther with them. Sure. Um, but they know something's going on, and to help them out, like your son, mm -hmm. he probably would have coped better if someone had sat down with him and reassured him um, what was going on, and this is what's going to happen, and given him maybe a timeline. Now, young children, they don't understand time, right. but older children do. Right. So if they could get a better perspective on what's going on, and then I think what is really helpful is the parents to kind of lift that burden because some children carry this. Yes, they do, don't you know, they? Even though we don't think they do, they carry it. I remember uh, when I was young, it was the um, the nuclear sure. the nuclear scare, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> we were all going to die from a nuclear right. holocaust. And, and at school, they'd make us hide under our desks. Right. And, and that was kind of scary for sure. me, right? Sure. And I remember a time when I was uh, carrying this. I was carrying it as a child. I was sure. worried for the world. And uh, my father said, notice that I was carrying this burden. And he asked me one day, he said, what are you, um, what are you so down and upset? And, you know, what, what, what's so heavy on you? And I shared with him that I was afraid. I was fearful and, and I was worried about the world. And, and um, he basically said to me, you know what? You let me carry that for you. I'll carry that for you. You can just hand it over to me and I'll, I'll carry it for you. And for some reason, and it's totally illogical, and you think there's no possible way in my adult mind today thinking my dad could actually keep me safe from the mm -hmm. nuclear holocaust. But at that point in my life, I knew my dad would protect me. And I was able to lift that burden off my shoulders, hand it to my father, and I went off and played Sure. And I know I'd be okay. Huh. And sometimes I think maybe that's what they need. They need to know that you're going to be there for them. Roger that. You know? Really important. Yeah. Well, thanks, Chap. Uh, yeah. Thank you for your time. Something that uh, we want to make sure that we're talking to our soldiers, our civilians, and our yeah. contractors, and their families. Because mm -hmm. I tell you, that's the number one thing that we are all concerned yeah. about is our families. Yeah. Thanks again, Chap. You're welcome.